misconfiguration of OBS. Um, so I'm double checking today you know, to make sure it's recording the correct screen and it is. Um, all right. So I do want to kind of show you guys a few things that before the, uh, we start the lecture, uh, there's a one link here called link to ask questions in lecture. Um, it will bring you to a form, okay? The form is gonna look like this. So it is, okay, it, this is my view you know, from your perspective. It is, let's see, there's a way to, there we go. So from your perspective, it looks like this. Um, you don't have to sign in you know, to your W account you know, at apps.losreels.edu to use this form. And even if you do, you can choose not to record your email address and not to write your name you know, down here. That's optional. But you can ask your question. So this is one way for me to collect questions from the class um, when we are in lecture. For people who you know, kind of, for whatever reason, you know, do not want to you know, raise the hand and ask the question. So I will check this periodically. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't send me notifications. I haven't really programmed it to send notifications yet. Um, so I cannot tell right away that you know, I got a question here. I think there's a configuration that I can actually do that. I can go to settings. Uh, I think there's a way to do it. I think it's under responses. Send responder a copy. No, that's not what I want. Question default. Um, defaults, maybe. Collect email address. Nope. I know there's a way I can get a notification. I just have to find it. Oh, get email notification for new responses. Click. There we go. All right, so that means you know if you guys you know, want to ask me questions during class, and you don't feel like you know um, raising your hand in class, you can use this method to contact me. But it takes me time to kind of switch back and forth to check this part. And what I will do is I'm going to show this on my other screen, so this way I can keep an eye on this while teaching class and not I having this to interfere with my. Uh, material being taught. Okay, so I'll move this back to the screen that you cannot see on my other side, so I can see it. There we go. All right, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do today is to talk about subtraction. My tablet is not working, but I will still try to use the screen as much as I can so that everything is still gonna be recorded. And we're already talking about subtraction, and so we'll do, what I'm gonna do is to rewind a little bit and talk about subtraction in base 10 and then we'll generalize the subtraction, um, and then we'll turn it into base two, and then we'll look for um, ways to use logic gates to implement subtraction. Um, there's one more thing I also want to show you guys, which I think can be beneficial. It is in the announcement. It is really important that you guys read the announcements. So because uh, in the lab, in the previous lab, I noticed that you know some people may benefit from a short tutorial on certain things. So I basically asked Chat GPT to make me a quick tutorial on certain things. Um, so you're more than welcome to kind of visit that link. Um, the benefit of going to this link is not just you know, because of the tutorial itself, it's also the prompt. In other words, this is the prompt that I made in order to have Chat GPT to generate a quick tutorial. Uh, so what I said is I need to learn about base conversion to establish the context of what I'm trying to do. To do so, I first need to understand how exponents work, the sigma notation, as well as the, the, the various parts of a division, such as dividend, divisor, quotient, and remainder. Please give me a quick tutorial of the prerequisite knowledge that I need in order to understand base conversion. So this is the prompt. And what ChatGPT gave me is a really quick tutorial. It's not super long. It is a quick recap of the concepts that we need to understand in order to understand base conversion and carry out all the calculations. So this is something that ChatGPT can do. I believe the free version, which means you don't have to sign in, can do this too, but you're limited in terms of how many queries or how many prompts you can make, I think per hour or per 
I cannot remember, yeah, but they, they place a certain limitation. Um, the full version, which is what I'm using here, is $20 per month. Considering this class has no actual textbook that you have to spend money on, um, you can instead spend the money on ChatGPT because this is going to be helpful to your other classes as well. Okay, I, I would consider this to be a productive use of ChatGPT or AI because you're not asking it to give you the actual answer or the solution of the quiz or homework assignment or exams. Instead, you're asking it to help you reinforce the concepts that you need in order to do well in your classes. So I think, <coughs> think about that, okay? You know, it's not required, it, it is not required that you need to have a chat GPT subscription or, you know, to any AI, you know, engine, but, you know, I think it's a, it's a resource that can be utilized well in this kind of class. All right, so having said that, we are already in the subtraction module, and this is the example that I showed in class last time. So the bottom line is Q is a little bit different this time. Instead of being the single digit sum, it is the single digit difference. So the example that I used to illustrate that is one minus four is a seven, but with a borrow of one. Okay, so that's how I'm, that's how I'm representing quote unquote negative three. Because you know, if you owe 10, but you have seven, that means your net worth is negative three. So it is the same way of representing the quantity of negative three, except it's broken up into two parts. How much do you have in your pocket, and how much do you owe to the digit that is immediately to your left-hand side? So are we okay with those concepts? Single digit difference and the borrow. You have been using those concepts all along since what, elementary school? It's just that you know, I specifically call out and explain those concepts today. So are we still good with those concepts? Okay, all right. So now what we want to do is to figure out how the digits relate to each other. Q is the single digit difference between the X and the Y. So one minus four is a seven, zero minus zero is a zero, five minus five is a zero as well. For the same reason, now we'll talk about the T later on, assuming we know how to compute the T's, the D row, which is the difference, is also the single digit difference between the Q and the T this time. Seven minus zero has a single digit difference of seven, zero minus one has a single digit difference of nine because it owes one to the next one. Zero minus one, once again, is a nine because it owes one to the next digit. So the big question is, how do we figure out the T? Okay, the T is really the borrow, yeah, but I cannot use B because B is already used for the function. So this one is contributed by X, uh, by X minus Y. One minus four is a negative quantity, and therefore it needs a borrow from the digit that is immediately to your left-hand side. That's why there's a borrow of one. But X minus Y is not the only reason that will contribute a borrow of one, because in this case, I'm gonna highlight the actual borrow. This borrow of one is not because of zero minus zero needs a borrow. It is because of zero minus one, the Q minus the T, that requires a borrow. So there are two sources to have a borrow of one. Does that remind you that there are two reasons there's a carry of one in addition? Do you see the similarity between subtraction and addition? There are a lot of similarities, okay? Because in addition, <coughs> the Q is the part is the single digit sum of x y, and then the S is the single digit sum of Q and T. This time, Q is the single digit difference between x y. D is the single digit difference between Q and T. So that structure is still the same. The only change is are we talking about a single digit sum versus a single digit difference? That's the only difference between the two. Second similar similarity is the T row as, as opposed to the K row. This one is contributed because of X minus Y. This one is, is the 
because of the zero minus one over here. But in addition, we encountered a very similar situation where the carry of one to the next column can be because of x plus y, but it can also be because of q plus k. Are we doing okay so far with noticing the similarities between addition versus subtraction? Okay, all right, very good. I'm checking on the question form. Nobody has been asking questions yet, so we're gonna proceed with, so how do we compute the, uh, the single digit difference and you know, the other things that we need to do? So the first thing is we want to look at the single digit difference. The single digit difference is also named R, okay, for a reason, okay, because most people would go like, why can't you use a different you know, function name because R was already used in uh, addition to represent the single digit sum. So this time when we're dealing with single digit difference, why do we keep the same name? That will be obvious later, okay? So the single digit difference between u, v, in this case both with base 10, is 10 plus u, u dispersed minus v. Because when u is less than v, let's say u is a one and v is a four, just like in the example, we're gonna have 10 plus one, which is 11, 11 minus four is a seven. So that's how we compute the single digit difference and guarantee that we are not gonna run into a negative value. Um, but there's also a mod 10 here, because what if u is greater than or equal to v to begin with? Like a nine and a two, okay? What if u is nine and v is two? So 10 plus nine is 19, 19 minus two is 17. 17 is not a digit in base 10. Well, that's okay, we can always just mod it with 10, then we get seven, and we got the answer. Are we doing okay so far with uh, the definition of R at this point? Okay, we're good. So now we move on to talk about the borrow, which is basically asking, if I were to subtract V as a single digit in base 10, actually in any base, from a single digit u in base 10, do we need a borrow? If so, you know, give me a one. If not, give me a zero. So this one is rather easy. It doesn't even depend on the base. All we need to know is whether the single digit u is less than the single digit v. If so, tell me it's a one because we need a borrow. Otherwise, give me a zero because we don't need a borrow. So are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So you can see how the R function and the B function are different compared to the R function and the C function in addition. If you want to look at everything in C code, this is how I would define it in C code. Um, it's basically the same thing. You know, I still use the ternary uh, expression here. I'm just you know, making sure that you know, we have a proper return statement and so on and so forth. So no surprises here, I hope. Are we still doing okay so far? All right, <clears throat> excellent. So the only thing that is a little bit tricky is um, how do the bits relate to each other? So over here, Q of I is the single digit difference between X I, Y I, which means it is this, the single digit difference of X I minus Y I. And then the difference Q of I is the single digit difference of Q I minus Q of I. But we talked about that already, okay? When I showed you the table in the multi-digit subtraction, I already pointed this out. This is really just capturing that pattern in a equation, using I to indicate which bit position we are talking about. So are we doing okay? Are there any questions at this point? Because I'm using a lot of symbols, okay? The reason why I'm using a lot of symbols is because this is the only way for me to generalize everything into a way so that we can actually structure and build the circuit itself. Are we okay with all of that? Okay, because you know, we, we have a lot of symbols, which means you know, studying before class and studying after class is really important because that's the only way you can get used to Oh, what is this symbol? We, you know, what is this symbol representing? You know, there's a certain amount of memorization that you need to do in order to absorb the material in the lecture. 
All right, so now we move on to um, any base, okay? So the way we move on to any base is um, to say that, okay, if we look at the base 10 version of how we define R and B, okay, the only thing that really relies on the base is this 10 over here and also this 10 over here. That's the only reference to the base that we were using, which is base 10. So if you're gonna use base seven, just change those two tens to seven and we are all good. If you wanna use base two, change those two tens to twos and we are all good to go. Is that okay? So that means if we reapply the R and the B functions for base two, it's gonna look like this. R of UV is gonna be two plus U, the whole thing minus V mod two because all we are doing is replacing the 10 to a two. There, are two. there were two occurrences of 10 in the definition of R, and I'm converting it into here. And we also, but for B, it doesn't matter because it has no reference whatsoever to the base itself. So we just keep the same thing, which is U minus V in parentheses, question mark one, colon zero. So that one does not get affected by you know which base we are using. So are we, doing okay so far with the reapplication of R and B, but in base 2 this time, instead of base 10. We're good? All right. Okay, so given we are okay with that, so once again, I'm going to generate a table to look at every single possible case of the application of the function B. U is a binary number, and so is V, which means they both can only be zeros and ones. So once again, we look at the truth table, or what looks like a truth table, like this, okay? Um, so I can explain this in multiple ways. We can apply B of UV actually, but you can also think about when do we need to borrow. Zero minus zero does not need to borrow. Zero minus one needs to borrow because the subprahend is larger than the minimum. Okay, so that's how we name the various parts of a subtraction. The number being subtracted is called the minuan, and the amount that we are subtracting from that number is called the subtrahend. So knowing those terms is useful because you can then identify the different parts of a subtraction. So why don't we do the same thing with addition? It's because addi addition is commuting. I just mentioned a word, okay? What, is, what does it mean when I say addition is commutative? Yes? Yes, you can switch the order of the operand without changing the result. In other words, x plus y gives you exactly the same result as y plus x. But the same thing does not apply to subtraction. And that's why in the subtraction and also in the division, it is important to identify those two numbers that you're starting off with because you know, which one is which one is actually important. In multiplication and addi in, in addition, because both of those operators are commutative, then it doesn't really matter which way you go and therefore the naming of those parts is not as important. All right, well, the other two cases are trivial. One minus zero eh, has no borrow, does not need a borrow, and then one minus one also does not need a borrow. So is this table understood? All right, cool. So in C, okay, in the carry function, we are just using conjunction itself. This time it looks like uh, it's not a conjunction because you know one one does not give us a one, it is zero one that gives us a one. Nonetheless, only one of the rows is giving us a one, so that gives me an idea. Why don't I just you know, negate u first here, turn it into a one, and then end it with the v, which is already a one, to get this one. And that's exactly how we define v of uv using logical operators, is we negate the u, and then we end it with the v. So are we doing okay so far with the conversion into binary operators for b? We're only focusing on b right now. Is that okay? Are you guys convinced that 
this B function would do the same thing as the original B function, which relies on addition, subtraction, and also division. Okay, if you're not convinced, you should go through the table and make sure that you work on every single row of that table and make sure that the result is the same before and after we convert into Boolean operators. Are we doing okay so far? I'm still checking and there, there, there are no questions yet you know, on the uh, form. All right, so now we look at the other one, which is the R function. So the R function, in once we convert it in base two, so getting back here, this is the R function in base two. So we'll just kind of work this out mentally, okay? So we'll go ahead and look at, what if U and V are both zeros? Two plus zero is two, two minus zero is two, two mod two is a zero. So that means, you know, zero, zero has a result of zero. What about zero, one? If U is a zero, V is a one, then we have two plus zero, which is two, two minus one is one, one mod two is a one. So if U and V are zero and one, then the result is a one. What about one zero? U is one and V is a zero. Mm -hmm. Two plus one is a three, three minus zero is a three, three mod two is a one. So that means when U is one, V is a zero, the result of R of one zero is a one. So the last one is what if they are both ones? One and one. Two plus one is a three, three minus one is a two, two mod two is again a zero. So that means the R of one one is a zero. Is that okay? I didn't really write anything. I, I was just kind of going through all the mental math based on the equation here. But to summarize, this is what it looks like. So when people look at this particular table, I'm expecting people to look at this table and go like, I think we have seen this before, okay? Because anyone who's not noticing that we have seen this before probably needs to study the material a little bit more because we saw exactly the same table for addition. The R function table for addition was exactly the same. So that means, oh, so that means we can just use exactly the same Boolean operators and the Boolean expression and be done with this. You're absolutely right about that. It is just exclusive or, or if you prefer to use your conjunction or disjunction, you know, this is the, mm -hmm. the way to kind of spell it out using operators that we are familiar with. But otherwise, if you can use an uh, exclusive or gate, you can just use exclusive or. All right, so do we have any questions at this point? Questions? Okay. So if there are no questions, we are moving on. And now we have the same difficulty of, oh, I, I, we can implement B using just Boolean operators. But what about this plus here? Can we convert this plus into a logical operator? Haven't we had this discussion already, but applicable for binary addition? Okay, I see some nods. Okay, so. To the people who are thinking, did we have a discussion about this? Once again, it is important to take notes, study the material before and after, okay? I cannot nag people enough about this because you know, that's what it takes to be successful in a college level class, especially one that transfers to a four year university. All right, so we have, we're gonna go through the same argument here, okay, which is, uh, can B of X, I, Y, I be a one when B of Q, I, T, I is also a one, okay? So we're gonna analyze if one is a one already, does it guarantee the other one has to be a zero and vice versa, okay? Because that was how we can show that, oh, it can never, they can not be once at the same time and so we don't have to worry about that. And as a result, this addition can be replaced by a by or, by a disjunction, very good, okay. So here's the discussion here, okay. Um, I'm, just a, I'm just gonna go through the, the argument you know, using words um, and instead of using a formal proof because this is not CIST 440, so Boolean algebra and formal proof is not what we 
need to emphasize here. Okay, so let's just say that E of XIYI is a one. Based on the definition of B of XIYI, looking at the table, what is the only case that B of XIYI can be a one? What has to be X1, what has to be XI, what has to be YI? XI has to be a zero, YI has to be a one. Very good. And based on how we define Q of I, what do you think Q of I is going to be? Given that XI is a zero, YI is a one. Q of I has to be a one, right? So if I know that Q of I has to be a one, can the B of QI and whatever QI is be a one? You, you're looking at the correct table right here to answer that question. I'm asking if Q of I is known to be a one to begin with, can B of QI, TI also be a one? Okay, so because QI is basically the first argument, we're looking at this row, this row, just those two rows. Um, look, I take it back because they're ones, right? So we are looking at this row versus and also this row here. Regardless of the value of V, which is T of I, the result has to be a zero. So this is the argument that I'm using to basically say if Q, if V of X, I, Y, I is a one, it guarantees V of Q, I, T, I has to be a zero. Is that okay? What kind of math have I used here in this particular argument? Almost zero. Because all I did was to use a table lookup. I don't even care about why the result is like this given the input, because that was discussed earlier. I was only using the table to argue that B of XIYI being a one guarantees Q, uh, B of QITI has to be a zero. So what is the difficulty of you know, understanding all this stuff here? I can tell you. The first one is familiarity of the names. What is XI? What is YI? What is QI? What is TI? That has to do with how things are named in a division. This is row X, row Y, row T, Q, row T, row D. And this entire column is column 0, column 1, column 2, and column 3. So being familiar with the notation is the key to understanding what I just said with that argument. Now, is that argument going to be something like that in the exam, in exam one? The answer is no, okay? But you need to be able to apply that line of reasoning in order to answer questions in exam one. So one week before exam one, I will give you um, an example of a previous test, a previous exam, you know, for the same exam one, and then you'll understand you know, what I mean when I said it is about problem solving. All my exams is about the application of what you learn in order to solve a problem. It is never about regurgitating uh, the definition of something or the name of something, because it's all open book and open notes. Why would I want you to just tell me something that you can find in the notes? It doesn't make sense to me. It also does not make sense in the sense that when you go out and become a software engineer or a developer, do you think your boss is going to come to you every week and just go like, okay, can, can you tell me what is the definition of an abstract class in C++? No, your boss does not care at all. Your boss will come to you every week. There will be a product to your uh, project meeting, and your boss will ask, How's that coming along? Okay, the deadline to get this API done is next Tuesday. Okay, how is that coming along? And hopefully, your answer is going to be, yep, I almost got the whole thing done. <laughs> I just need to document it a little bit and test it a little bit. We should be able on time. You know, on Tuesday, it will be. Pu it, I, I will have it ready. Okay, so it is about the application. It's not about memorization. All right, so getting back, okay, I digressed a little bit. So getting back to the argument here, and the other way around, 
is to ask, if I know B of Q, I, T, I is a one, how can I be sure that B of X, I, Y, I has to be a zero? Okay, same argument. If B of Q, I, T, I is a one, looking at the definition of B right here, that means this is a one, but that automatically locks down that Q, I has to be a zero and B, I, I mean, uh, T, I has to be a one, right? Because that's the only way you can make the B function to return a value of one in base two. Is that okay? So this line of thinking is called constraint-based thinking. I'm looking at the table and I'm asking, if this is a result, what is the consequence? What is, what is the implying? Oh, the only thing that can make this happen is QI is a zero, TI is a one. Okay, how is that gonna help? Well, knowing that QI, which is the application of R, is a zero, now I look up R, the R table, which is now basically asking, we know QI is a one, what can I say about XI, YI? So this time you cannot lock down XI, YI to just, oh, XI has to be this and YI has to be this, but you know one thing, they have to be different. One has to be a zero, the other one has to be a one. Is that okay? So if they are different, um, if they are different, okay, let me let me see. I need to think about this a little bit. <laughs> so we know QI has to be of one. No, we know QI has to be a zero. I take it back, sorry. We know QI has to be a zero. We are, so we are looking at these two rows. So I take it back, sorry, you know, I mentioned the wrong thing. Because we know Q of I is a zero, let me just repeat that whole thing again. Because we are looking at this one here as the result of B, this is QI, this is TI, so we know that QI has to be a zero. If QI is a zero, then we are looking at QI being a zero here, QI being a zero here, this would be XI and this would be YI. So I have to kind of go back and kind of reverse the argument. It doesn't tell you that XI has to be a zero or YI has to be a zero, but it tells you one thing, they have to be the same. XI, YI are guaranteed the same. <coughs> so now the question is, if XI, YI are guaranteed the same, what is the B of XI, YI? So now we switch back to the B table, and we go like, oh, if they are the same, then the B of XI, YI is guaranteed a zero. Which means, that's the conclusion, right? Because you know, what I'm saying is, if B of QI, TI is a one, then B of XI, YI is guaranteed a zero. That is the argument. And I did not use any fancy math. All I did was to basically reuse the tables, apply the tables, and logically work this out. Okay? Are we okay with the argument? More or less, okay. Now in this class, I'm not, yeah, go ahead, sorry. of the same point, okay? Because they're very, very similar. So with that, okay, with what I just said, it means, you know, instead of using a addition here, I can turn it into a disjunction. Why is that important? We talked about the importance of doing something like this in binary addition. So what is the importance of turning a, an arithmetic addition into a Boolean disjunction? Not only is it more efficient, it can be implemented using logic gates, right? Because we know how to do an OR, logical OR, using NAND gates. And we know how to make NAND gates out of transistors. So that means 
this can now, the entire thing, can be made out of NAND gates, which translates to transistors. And that is really kind of the big deal of this entire section here. I don't, I don't see any expression going like, wow, we can do everything in transistors. <laughs> because if I were a student in this class, taking this class and not knowing all this stuff ahead of time, I would be going like, oh, that's how we can do addition and subtraction using only transistors. Basically, that is the most basic building blocks inside the processor. Are we doing okay so far with all of this? Okay. Because the understanding why we are doing this, I think, is just as important as what we are doing. Because without understanding the why, the what is really just about memorization. It's never about reasoning, but understanding the why and then understanding the what makes the link, okay? It's, it's reasoning going through, oh, we want to do everything using transistors. But in a computer, in order to compute, it needs to add, it needs to subtract, it needs to divide and multiply. But division and multiplication can be done using comparison, uh, bit shifting, and addition and subtraction. So once we have all the basic operators done, we can do all the fancy stuff like multiplication, division, sine, cosine, and all that stuff. Okay. Just yesterday, I found a way to compute the value of pi using a series. Um, if I remember correctly, you don't have to remember this. This is totally um, outside of the, the scope of this class. So it starts with um, division by four. So it's four divided by one. Okay, so let's figure this out. It's four divided by one minus four divided by, I think it jumps by four here. No, 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 not the right. I think it's three and then, no. It's something like this, okay, I may not have done this correctly, but it's alternating the addition and the subtraction and you're dealing with four divided by your one, three, five, seven, and so on, and then you just flip the sign for every single one of these. And that's how you can compute, that's one way to compute pi. And I was going like, oh, that is kind of cool, because you know, um, the computation of pi is fascinating because it is an irrational number, um, which means you know there's an infinite number of digits to that whole thing. There's no repeating pattern of those digits either. So this turns out to be a quick and easy way to, well, I wouldn't say quick, but it is an easy way to compute pi. So I was going like, oh, that is interesting. <coughs> All right. So I'm going to pause a little bit and see if there are any questions about everything that we have talked about all the way up to here. Questions, all right. So if there are no questions, I'm gonna give you, you know, just a short paragraph that used to be another class or two on this entire topic because I'm trying to shave a little bit of time at the beginning of the semester so I have more time to talk about the actual programming side of this entire class. So what I'm saying is um, if we only use the material that we have talked about so far, the first solution to an adder or subtractor is what we call a carry ripple or a borrow ripper adder or subtractor. It will get the job done, okay? It's one of those easiest things to explain. You know, I can show you in, in Logistim. In fact, I'm gonna do it. But it's a very inefficient way of doing things. So there are mechanisms that make it a lot faster, but it will take me another two classes to explain. And it's a little beyond the scope of this class, okay? So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go there anymore. But for those of you who are interested, you can look into what we call carry look ahead and borrow look ahead subtractor and adder, okay? Because you know, it's, it's interesting how they use Boolean algebra to kind of make that happen. But there's a certain complexity to the whole thing and so I go like, okay, well, I'm just gonna back off and not talk about it. 
Okay. All right. So there are some AI generated exercises here. Okay. So we have addition uh, questions and subtraction you know, questions, and each one of these is just like this. Okay. Add one zero one one and zero one one zero as binary numbers. I'm not going to do it in the class. Okay. I want you guys to do it first. Okay. And this is the answer. You know, if you click on this symbol here, it will give you the answer. If your answer is not matching and you don't know why it's not matching, or you talk to a few people and they all give, have the same result as you, it is entirely possible that I am wrong. So tell me about it, okay? If you notice something is suspicious, it's like um, me and three classmates you know, came up with this answer, but you know, the actual key is not that. Well, in those cases, let me know and then you know, we'll work on it in class. But these are the examples that you can work out just to try out whether you can do binary subtraction or not. Are we good so far? All right, cool. So now I'm just gonna show you guys how to build a very simple adder. It's once again, it's called a carry ripple adder. It is not efficient. It's just easier to understand compared to the more efficient way of doing addition. But before that, I'm gonna take roll because my watch just buzzed me, which reminds me to take roll. So hopefully everybody is here right now. And the roll taking activity is this one. And I'll show you the access code. It's just sub for subtraction. So I'm gonna write it on the board, SUB is the access code for the row taking activity. And then I'm going to start up LogiSim and show you how to build an adder. The access code is on the whiteboard. We got some time to do it. Yeah. All right, so. Are we ready to work on the actual adder circuit? We good? Okay, so I, I'm gonna ask you guys, do you want me to work on adder, an adder, or a subtraction? It's up to you. Or something that can turn into an adder or subtractor. Let's do that. Let's do a general device, and with only one pin, I can control whether we are dealing with adding or subtraction. How, how, does, how does that sound? Okay, sound good? All right, so we, let's do that. All right, so we, so we have to think about the, the most basic things that we need to do, which is the R and the B, or the C, right? So we have to look at you know, the inputs. So I'm going to call one input um, the U. And then we'll duplicate this and then call the other input V because you know, that those are the two um, parameters that we need. Okay, ah, come on. Move. <laughs> I can't grab it. There we go. All right, so this is V, okay? And then we also need another input to tell us are we adding or are we subtracting? Okay, so we'll use another one here. And I think if I want to subtract, if it, so this is basically subtraction, okay? If it is a one, we are performing subtraction. Is that okay? So out of this whole thing, I need two output pins. So once again, if you want input pins and output pins, it's best to use these two as opposed to the ones under wiring. So I'm gonna use this as an output pin. So one output pin is easy, it's just R itself, okay? So I'm just gonna call this R of U and V, oops. 
There we go. And then the other one is going to be a little funky because it depends on whether we are adding or subtracting. It can be the B or the C function. So this one is either B or C of U of V, okay? U and V. There we go. So are we doing okay so far? You know, as far as you know, what is, what are the inputs to this loop three circuit, and what are the outputs of this loop three circuit? Okay. So mm -hmm. all we want is to say, okay, give me two numbers, two single digits, u and v. Tell me whether we're subtracting or adding, and the circuit will give me simultaneously the r function value of u v, and also the b or the c, you know, depending on whether we're adding or subtracting between the u and the v. So, because I'm lazy, I'm going to work on the easy one first. The easy one is going to be the R, because it's just an exclusive OR. So the way we do it is to go to gates. I'm not going to make everything out of NAND2 gates and then make the NAND2 gate myself. So I'm going to use the exclusive OR gate, okay, which is gigantic. So we turn it into a narrow, which makes it smaller. We also want to limit the input to just what we need, which is just two inputs. This is important because we don't want to use a gate where only some of the input pins are connected and others are not. So we want to make sure that you know, both inputs are used here because in both adding and subtracting, the R is really just the exclusive OR between X and Y. So that's why we can use one single gate here and be done with it. Woohoo, done. So now we need to work on the B versus the C function. You go like, um, how are they different, right? So how can we use the subtraction input pin to determine you know, which one it is and you know, to make some changes to the actual calculation? So I'm gonna switch back to the notes, okay? Because I wanna point out where you can see and visualize the differences. So we go all the way back to the definition of B, okay? So you can see how B is the negative version of U and V. And we go to the definition of C, which is from addition. And right here, you can see how it is just U without the negation and V. So that means the only difference between C and B is whether we negate U first, U as in the variable. Is that okay? So noticing Similarities and differences, once again, is important. Okay, that's what programming is all about. It's also what math is all about. Computer science is a branch of mathematics. There's no avoiding understanding that computer science is a branch of mathematics. It really is. So now we go like, okay, great. Okay, so we know we have to perform an end. Okay, let's do that first. Okay, do all the easy stuff first and then kind of work on the more difficult stuff mm, a little later. So we pull an AND gate out and we go like, okay, let's make this narrow and limit the um, input to only two inputs. And the result that is going out to of this entire thing is the output of the AND. The only question is, are we negating U first before this gate here? V is just going to the second input regardless, okay? So I'm gonna do it, do the lazy thing first. So we know that one is here. So now the question is, um, how do we make this circuit so that it would negate U in a subtraction, but it is not gonna negate U when it is not a subtraction, okay? The answer is, I'm not asking you guys to derive the answer because you know, this class does not require Boolean algebra, so you guys, you know, it's okay not to know it. So I'm gonna give you the answer, okay? The answer is another exclusive OR gate. Okay, so we'll take, we'll take a look at this magical thing here, okay? So I duplicate this, move this, eh, this would be a good place to do it. The output of the exclusive OR goes to this end here, and one side it is tapping into U, the other side is tapping into the control input to determine whether we are adding or subtracting. Okay, so now you have to ask yourself, if subtraction is a one, okay, if input pin is a one, and u is a zero, what is the exclusive or between u and subtraction? What is the result of zero exclusive or with one? 
One. The extended negation of zero? Yep. Okay, good. What about if the input is one? Okay, if u is one and subtraction is also a one, <coughs> what is the output of the exclusive OR gate that is selected right now? It's going to be a zero. Is zero the negation of one? I think we got it, right? So you can always test a circuit you know, by using the poking tool. You can always test it. It's like, okay, if we are subtracting, the output here is the negation of the input. Cool. And if we are not subtracting, it is just itself. So this particular exclusi exclusive OR gate here is doing a very special job because it is basically saying, uh, tell me whether we are subtracting or not. If, if we are subtracting, I will go ahead and negate u. If we're not subtracting, I'm not going to negate u. The purpose of that, the um, exclusive OR gate, where the cursor is, is doing just that job. But now you can see, oh, what about the rest? The rest of the entire circuit does not need to know whether we are adding or subtracting. Is that okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna turn this into its own circuit, okay? And the way to do that is to go to the appearance part of, actually, yeah, we go to the appearance, and then we're gonna give it a name, okay? This is called a half adder or half subtractor. So we're gonna say uh, HAS, <laughs> half adder subtractor, because you can do either. And you know, because we have so many input pins, I think it is good to label the pins too. So we have u, v, and you know, whether we are subtracting or not, okay, subtracting versus adding. And then the output one is the r of the output, and then the other one is either the b or the c, depending whether we are adding or subtracting. I know the, the labels are all over the place, but this is why I'm gonna <laughs> adjust everything now, make, make it look kinda nice. There we go. Add, subtract versus adding. And then these labels, I'm going to make it on the outside, okay? Just a little bit here. I mean, the labeling is really just nice to have. You know, they're not essential, okay? But if I don't put the label here, I'm not going to remember which pin is which pin. All right, cool. And then the next thing we need to do is to go to the main circuit and change the circuit name here because it's not really the main circuit anymore. This is just one component that we need to use in order to make our special device. So I'm just gonna say this is a has, which is a half adder subtractor. Okay, so if this is named a half adder subtractor, what do you think is the next component we're gonna make? Full, full right? Because you know, if there's a half something, that means there has to be a full something. So this is you know, basically, again, you know, pattern matching and being able to uh, understand the implication, okay? Because if there's an anti-something, there's probably a non-anti-something, right? So if, a, if there's a half-something, there's probably be a whole or full something. So now we're gonna make the full adder. So we go to project and go to add circuit. So this is gonna be a full adder subtractor. Okay, so we'll take a look at how we make this happen. So the way we make this happen is um, we go back to the equations, okay? So if, if we go back to the equations, the trickiest part of the entire thing is how do we compute k of i plus one? So k of i plus one is the c of x, y, or the c of q, k, and then the t of i plus one is likewise, okay, let me scroll all the way down to here. So the t of i plus one is the b of x, i, y, i, or the B of Q, I, K, I. So that means, hmm, what are the inputs to this entire thing? The input to this entire thing to compute T of I plus one is X, I, Y, I, not Q, I, because Q, I is computed from X, I, Y, I. But T, K, I is, oh, this is supposed to be T, I, sorry. So I need to fix this too. This is supposed to be T, I, but T, I is also an input. There are three inputs to this entire thing, plus the one that specifies are we adding or subtracting. So we need four input pins. What about output pins? The output pins will be T of I plus one is one output, 
but then the actual result, if it's z of i, is also going to be output. So we have two outputs, four inputs, two outputs. The important part about doing this is you have to first understand what we are given with and what we want to compute before you try to figure out how to do it. Okay? Let me explain that again. And understanding what you need to do is the first step because only after that you can try to figure out how to do it. So what go comes first and then how. The why is also important, be, but you know, we kind of have an imp implied why because we want to become software engineers, get hired, and make a lot of money. I will not be surprised that in four years or so, some of you will come back you know, to visit your family and then you come to my office and go, ha ha tech, I'm making more money than you do. I would not be surprised at all, okay? All right, so that's, I think that's a good thing. I don't mind my students making more money than I do. Or I don't mind my students being smarter than I do. In fact, I'm happy if my students are, you know, are smarter than I am. Because at one point in time, at some point in time, I'm gonna need a pacemaker and other devices to keep me alive, and I want you guys to be better than I am so that I can trust what you're making so I can trust that pacemaker to be doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. <laughs> it is for selfish reasons that I want you guys to, ex to excel and be better than I am. Because I won't trust myself to make a pacemaker, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, getting back to what we are working on here. All right, so inputs, okay? So we, we have a whole bunch of inputs here. We have four input pins. But this is the way of thinking, okay? I think it is important to kind of know how I think about these things because it gives you a reference. Now, if you don't like the way I think and go like, I'm not gonna think like that, that's fine, not a problem. But at the same time, you know, it gives you a reference point. It's like, okay, I can choose not to think the way that tech does. My own son tells me, dad, most people do not think the way think about things the way that you do. Go like, thanks. So this is either a K or a T of I. Okay, so I'm just going to use that. And then this one is saying, you know, are we subtracting or are we adding? And then as far as the output pins are concerned, we have the sum or the difference as one pin. So this one is going to be labeled uh, difference versus sum of I. And then the next one is either the t or the k of i plus one. So this is either t or k of i plus one. There we go. I cannot really do subscript here, so that's why it looks kind of ugly. All right, so what do we do? Okay, first question is, since this is called the full adder subtractor, what component do you think it's gonna be? half ones, right? How many of the half ones do, we, do you think we need to make a full? Two. Very good. So, I mean, all of this is important, okay? Because this is actually how we think about things, okay? So we need two of these, okay? So do a duplicate of these two, okay? Placement is not super important because we just need to slap them here so that we can take, take account of things. So the first question is, um, don't we need to know Q of I too? The Q of I is not one of the input pins, it's not one of the output pins. Where is it? Well, because we can compute Q of I using the R function, right? And when you look at this picture here, mm, can you kind of tell me how we can get Q of I? You can pick one of the hats here. Just I, I'm just gonna put this one off the screen and focus on one. Okay. So given that we have one half adder subtractor, how are we gonna compute Q of I? How do we wire this thing up? Yep. Exactly. Okay. So if I hook it up like this, okay, I don't really technically need you know the subtract versus the add but it would seem to make sense that 
if we are told to perform subtraction, we better make sure the has is also doing subtraction, right? So that kind of makes sense. Okay, so now where am I getting the Q of I? Which output of this has is going to give me Q of I? The top one, very good, okay, because Q of I is the R of X I Y I, okay? So I am going to label this, okay? There's no easy way to label a wire other than just typing it in. So I'm gonna remind myself, okay? This is just a regular label. It is not, it doesn't have any particular meaning. Oh, okay, I think I got it wrong. This is not the way we want to do it. Because I think it's the whole gate having the Q of I. know whether I can undo that. It's undoing the wire. Oh, I can't change this. Ah, this is awful. Okay. <coughs> I made a mistake and Logisim doesn't let me make any changes. Okay. Huh? Oh, it's under label. Oh, right. Okay, thank you go because all I really want to do is to label the wire which does not have an option to label so I'm gonna have to put QI way out here so it doesn't also automatically associate it with the chip and then just drag it over here there we go all right so now that we have Q of I where is that supposed to go what needs Q of I for cannot remember it's okay to look it up okay so we go back to the notes and then we look up okay there's there we go so we see q of i here okay so we know q of i needs to be combined with t of i and this is a typo to compute the b so that we can compute t of i plus one but there's another place we need it because we also need q of i to compute uh, uh, d of i in this case so if you scroll all the way back back a little bit more there we go d of i relies on is the is the r of q of i t of i okay all right so knowing that we i think we need to use this guy now right but where do we attach q of i to to the top to u or do we attach it to d to u because we want to compute R of UV. Now, R doesn't really matter which way is which way, but the B does, right? Because B wants to negate only the first operand, but not the second one. So that means, okay, I have to be a little careful here and make sure that this only go here, okay? And the R of this is gonna be the result, which is our difference or the sum. So this goes all the way to this particular output, easy one. What about this V? Where do we attach this V to? In other words, when we utilize Q of I in the R or in the D, who is the assumption? K or T, right? The KI or the TI. So that's the other pin that has not been used up to this point that has to go here. There we go. And whether we are adding or subtracting is universal, so both of these need to understand that we are adding or subtracting. So are we good so far? So when you look at this diagram, okay, one way to think about are we done with the diagram is do we have things that are not attached, that are not used up to this point? We have three things that are not used. We have the BC coming out of this thing here that is not used. And then we have the BC that is also not used here. So now the question is, how do these two have anything to do with the T or the K of I plus one? Okay, so what is exactly this? This is either the B for subtraction or the C in the case of an addition of X, I, Y, I. This one here is the B or the C, depending on whether we're adding or subtracting, of Q, I and K, I, T, I. How do we use those two? Let's go back to the notes, okay? So you, if you go back to the notes, okay, you go to the last form here, 
Oh, we're supposed to or, we're supposed to use a or between these two to come up with t of i plus one. The k of i plus one is similar. Yes. Oh, I thought you had a question. No. Okay, that's all right. So that means oh, okay. So that means we need one more gate, right? Be because we need an or gate to to combine the borrow of the two to become a single borrow to the next digit. So now we go to gates again, huh. and then we go like, okay, let's make an OR gate, make it narrow, and only have two input pins, okay. And we're gonna stash it right here because the output of the OR gate goes straight to the output here. So we take this, which is, the order doesn't really matter in this case because this junction is also commutative. So we do, it doesn't matter which one goes to the top, which one goes to the bottom, as long as they're both attached, we're good. So now we have a full adder subtractor for one bit. In other words, each column of the multi-digit addition or subtraction can now be implemented by a circuit like this. Is that okay so far? So I want to make a three bit adder subtractor. Yeah. Okay, so we want to take a look at what it, what that is going to look like. We got enough time to do it, plenty of time. So we go to project, add another circuit, and this time I'm going to say this is a three by three, which, is, which means the inputs of x is three bit wide, the input of y is also three bit wide. So three by three, um, this is a subtractor adder. All right. So since we just built the full adder subtractor, I'm guessing that's needed here, okay? But before we even go there, we're gonna say, okay, what number, what are the inputs? There are four inputs again. Okay, so I'm gonna stash four things here and then I'll explain what those four things are. And then we have two things coming out of the whole thing. Okay. All right. The first two things we need are the two things that are really obvious. Uh, what are we adding or subtracting? So the label of these two, one is X, the other one is Y. Q is not here because Q is computed internally, so it's not a big deal. The other input here is K0 or T0. So this is T slash K0. So the, the borrow or the carry to bit zero is an input. We talked about this a little bit because this way we can basically chain multiple of these devices to perform a wider addition or subtraction, okay? It makes it stackable. How many people have played with Legos? This is basically the stub on the Lego so that the Lego pieces can stack up, okay? And then the last one is you know, specifying, are we adding or subtracting? So it has the same label, which is just, you know, are we subtracting? If we are subtracting, it's a one. If we're adding, it is a zero. As far as the output is concerned, one is the actual output that we want, which is either the sum or the difference. So it's either D or S, okay, as the sum or the difference. And then the other one is the overall carry or the overall borrow, which is, in this case, um, T or K of three, because we want to make a three-bit adder. So the most significant or the overall carry or borrow is bit three. Okay, all right. So next thing is to say basically these things, they all need to be um, three bit wide. So I just did a multi-select. You can do that using uh, control shift, I think. Um, you can select multiple things. And Logisim is pretty smart in this sense that it will actually recognize common things between all of these things and if you make a change, like you know, in terms of the number of data bits from one to three, it applies it to everything that is being selected. So that's pretty handy as a feature. All right, cool. So now we need to go like, okay, now what do we do? I think we need the full adders, okay? We need the three of these because each one is only performing the, per performing the calculation of one column. So we're gonna need three of those. But the output of this is is a cable that has three wires inside. The input to these 
is only a single bit. So what do you think we need? A splitter, very good. So we got, we're gonna need two splitters in this case and, two, and one single splitter to merge the output of these things back into one. So we'll go to wiring, go pick out you know, the splitter and the, what about the bit width in? What, what should it be? Hmm? Three, that is correct. So we have three and we also want the fan out to be three because we need every single one of those bits. I will do a control D, you know, just to make a copy of this, and then control D again because we need three of those. All right, so we attach this one to, um, mm, I need to move things around a little bit, just a little. Okay, so now we have you know, the three bits of X, and now we have the three bits of Y. And then for this one, we need to flip it around because the merged end connects to the actual difference or the sum. So uh, we go to heading or facing and make it face west, like so. And stash this one over here, make this connection here. There we go. All right, let's focus on one thing at a time. We look at this bit here. This is x0, this is y0, this is k0. Hmm. I think they all go into one single one. They all go into one of the the full adder subtractors. So we're going to use one of these. Okay, let me put it here. Um, okay, this is this is my bad. I forgot to label the pins. Let me go back and label the pins first. So we go back to the full adder, go to appearance, and now we have to label the pins. And by this time, I have totally forgotten which one is which one. So one way you can do it, okay, this is really handy, is to just kind of long press on a button on a, one of the pins, and it will show you in a picture-in-picture picture, you know, at the lower right-hand side where is the location of the actual pin in the circuit. That can be very helpful for you to double-check and go like, is which pin is this? I think this is the U, okay? That's, that's, P, that's U, the next one is V, and then the next one is... Um, the carry or the borrow, and the last one is the subtract and the adding. All right, so I'm gonna just put a bunch of labels here, so this way I don't forget. So we got U, um, nope, I take it back, not U, X, X, Y. Because we're talking about the full adder, so it is about X, I, Y, I, uh, T of I, or K of I, T slash K, I, and whether we are subtracting, so we'll just we'll do a sub slash a, a, and then the output, the first one is the actual result. I cannot remember, better double check. Okay, we'll look at the second one. The second one is the carry or the borrow to the next digit. So the second one, in terms of text, is gonna be t slash k i plus one, and then the top, one on the right hand side is the actual sum versus the difference vs of i all right so now you get to move things around a little bit just to make sure it's easier to read this is xi this is yi this is the carry or the borrow to this column this specifies whether we are adding or subtracting and then the bottom one is the output to the next column and then this is the actual result of the current column. All right, so that should improve, you know, the way it reads here because now we have all the labels. Oh, with all the labels, it's super easy to make the attachments, right? Because this is X zero, well, that means I is just zero, okay? We make that attachment. This is Y zero, so it has to go to this pin here and I think I need to move things around a little bit just to make sure there's enough room. This is T0, okay? So this one goes all the way here. And this is just dictating, are we adding or subtracting? It goes here. Are we good so far? Yes. This one? Sorry? 
It is T slash K I on the full one. You mean this one? I think that is the T K I. Okay, let me double check. Yeah. Oh, the naming is off. Okay, let's let's change the naming here because I want to be consistent. T slash K I. The reason why I'm using T and not T slash K instead of K slash T is because when this is subtract, this is a tick. When this is adding, this is a carry. So I want that to be consistent too. All right, so getting back here, uh, this is the second one. Okay, I'm gonna put it here, give, it, give myself a little more space. I think I may run out of routing resources. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Yeah, that is not looking good. Um, okay, so X, I, Y, I go to the second one. This is for bit one, and this one is for bit three. So we'll stagger that also. And, <laughs> nope, I, well, let's see. I can still, no, mm-mm, mm-mm. I'm running out of routing you know, resources, so I have to either move things around a little bit or use tunnels, which is a, to do it. Oh yeah, the I have I just painted myself to a corner. Because this has to go here. Um I can make some adjustments and make it happen. So this way I can move Okay, this is what you can do in Logisim is you can actually change the position of a vertical line just by dragging it. By doing so, I'm giving myself a little bit more room for you know, kind of doing the routing. So this is gonna go here. This is gonna go here. <laughs> I, I may be painting myself to a corner later on too, but you know, right now it's okay. And this one, I think I still have enough routing resources here to get this done. This goes to bit YI over here. All right, so as we have the circuit here, there are a few input pins that have not been determined. So let's go ahead and fix all the ones that we know how to do already. So all the SA should be connected to the same thing, okay, so that's the easy one. Because once we specify are we adding or subtracting, it should apply to all of the add or subtractor. So that part should not be, should be pretty easy. The difficult one is what about this one here? This is the TIKI as an input, but it should connect to the T of T or K of I plus one. So the output from the previous one should connect to the next one here. And once again, you know, I kind of painted myself to a corner because you know I just kind of run out of routing resources. So I'm just gonna <laughs> move things around a little bit until I get enough space to do it. I used to do board layout in circuit boards, so you know I, there are a few tricks I can pull from those experiences. There we go. All right, so we're almost done, right? Um, the DS are the actual results, so bit zero of the bit zero goes here. This is going to bit one, and this is going to bit two. So those are the easy ones. And at this point, I think the only thing left over to do is pretty obvious. There's one output pin that is not connected. There's one input pin that is also not connected. We are talking about this guy here. This is the overall carry or borrow of the entire calculation. And it needs to go to the overall output pin here try and we're done uh, we are running out of time I don't want to take up your lab time to finish this or to test the circuit so I'm going to save this so that we can test it you know, on next Tuesday okay but this is how you this is how I can make what we call a carry ripple you know, add or subtractor because it can do both the most important part of this circuit is until this thing is done this thing cannot give me the correct answer. 
until this thing is done, this thing cannot give me the correct answer because of the connection here. This circuit requires this output to be correct first. This circuit depends on this, in this output of this circuit first. So this is why this is called a recurring adder or a subtractor. And this is also why it is inefficient because the amount of time for a 64-bit adder to kind of give me the result, it would be eight times the amount of time of an 8-bit adder. It is linear to the width of the integer, okay? Now, in terms of the design, I know it just looks complicated already. By comparison, this is like easy peasy compared to the more efficient design, which is called a carry look ahead adder or a borrow look ahead subtractor. But that is a little bit more involved in terms of the math and also the design, so I decided not to include it in this class for this semester because this way I have more time later on. So I'm going to save this so we can talk about this next Tuesday. And let's see, save. And I'll just stash it into here. We'll call this you know, 3 by 3 uh, ripple, ripple subtractor adder. There we go. Okay, so we'll get back to this one. We'll test it, and we'll try to figure out also how are we going to test this? Can we test this using the test driver? Okay, so I'm going to make a new test driver just <coughs> for this circuit here, and you guys can say, oh, so that's how we derive the test driver, okay? And this is how we test a circuit. So we'll, we'll talk about that next Tuesday. This is all still getting recorded, so I can remind myself what I need to do. So at this point, we're going to go back to the canvas so that I can release the lab for today. So the, the lab for today, how long it's going to take you to do, depends on how much of the material you're absorbing in class, because it's all about you know, subtracting and adding. But it's neither in base 10 nor base 2. So you're going to have to apply the R and the B or the R and the C function to a different base, which is like base 11, base 5, that sort of thing. So let me go ahead and unhide this. Yeah, this is a slightly different uh, way of doing things, so it doesn't give me the actual access code right away. I have to go here, go to settings, and show access code. So the access code is X, Y, Q, K, S. That's the access code of today's lab. And if people are questioning, it's like, why is it Q, X, Y, Q, K, S? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to have to say again. You, know, you guys know what I'm going to say again you need to study a little bit more because these are the names of the roles for an adder. All right, so you guys should be able to do it now um, because I just, un it, it's unhi unhidden. And uh, can you guys get into it? Just wanted to make sure before I go. Yep, okay, excellent. All right, so I am going to get out of this screen. Once again, the access code is in the box, and I'll lower the workstation so people in the back can see it too. There you go. And I think I can stop the recorder now and